John records after this a Jewish festival took place, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. By the Sheep's Gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool called Bethesda in Aramaic, which has five colonnades. Within these lay a large number of the disabled, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man who was there who had been disabled for 38 years, and when Jesus saw him lying there and realized that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to get well? I don't know about you, but I've come to expect those shocking questions from, from Christ in John's gospel, but he asked the man, do you want to get well? Sir, the disabled man answered, I've no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. Get up, Jesus told him, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man got well, picked up his mat and started to walk. Now that day was the Sabbath, and so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, this is the Sabbath, the law prohibits you from picking up your mat. He replied, the man who made me well told me, pick up your mat and walk. Who is this man who told you, pick up your mat and walk, they asked. For the man who was healed did not know it was because Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. After this, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Do not sin anymore so that something worse doesn't happen to you. The man went and reported to the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore, the Jews began persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Uh, John chapter 5, we're exiting out of chapter 4, going on into a a new section of uh, John's gospel, which I'm sure will hopefully, there it is. Thank you, Jesse. Um, So let me just quickly uh, remind you of, uh, this is the the overall, the big uh, kind of 21 chapters breakup of John's Gospel that I've given, uh, and I've broken that into four sections. This is pretty common. Most uh, commentaries, most preachers will break it up, at least the big chunks, into, you know, you've got the prologue, you've got uh, the first half of the book, which is the book of Signs, second half, uh, chapter 12, 50 to 13, sort of a real transitional point, Uh, with um, the book of glory, and that has uh, the ultimate display of glory with Jesus crucified on the cross. Uh, And then in chapter 21, you sort of have the epilogue or the postlude to John's gospel. Now, within this major breakup, you you, you have a, a number of smaller sections, and we've just come out of one. Last week, if you remember, I was saying we came out of the Cana cycle, chapters two to four. Now we're going into a, a second cycle called the festive cycle or the festival cycle. This is uh, in chapters five to ten. And uh, as you can see, this is a section called the festival cycle because Jesus is visiting lots of festivals. Uh, and also because... Um, this section is um, bookended, starts in chapter 5, 18, with Jesus making himself equal to God and the Jews wanting to kill Jesus. And then at the, uh, toward the end of chapter 10, we have Jesus making himself equal to God and the Jews wanting to kill Jesus. So it's sort of um, a recognized big chunk of John's gospel. And then throughout it, you have various signs, various festivals, and so on and so forth. Uh, and the whole point of this festival cycle uh, is, is to simply say uh, this, that Jesus is God, that he's equal to God, his Father, in glory, grace, and truth. And, and chapter 5 is really where this idea of I and the Father and, and, and being one and equal in, in glory and judgment and grace and all these things, it's really going to kick off. So our verses this morning, 1 to 16, are the introductory remarks to this big festival cycle that we're going to see throughout chapters 5 to 10. So let's pray one last time, ask God's uh, spirit to work in his word, and then we'll open up to John 5. Heavenly Father, your word, the word of your word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, Your words are life-giving, they are sin-killing words of, of, of grace, Lord. Every line speaks the glory of the face of the Father shining through the Son, through this Holy Spirit inspired word that you've given from your divine mind. This word, Lord, that raises people who are dead in their sin and trespasses to new life and the one that bore that sin on the cross. 
Father, we ask that in our time of worship in the Word right now that you would give us the words of eternal life. Words that comfort and correct, convict and convert, and we promise, Lord, to respond in greater faithfulness and obedience as a result of your sovereign grace working here in our hearts today. And we ask all these things in the precious name of your Son, the one who is our Sabbath rest. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Invalid. 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 Not valid. Inconsequential. Not valuable. Invalid. We can never be sure or certain, but I'm pretty confident this is one of the reasons why people today no longer refer to the disabled in society as invalids. Uh, If you are unable to walk, talk, or move your limbs in any kind of normal person fashion, then you are no longer valid by society's standards. Originally, though, the term is actually used in the time of war to refer to the physically maimed and, and those who were unfit for civic duty. The word today, however, brings about a negative connotation in a lot of people's minds. It brings perhaps a rather invalid conclusion, pardon the pun, about those made in God's image. If you're reading from the King James Version here this morning, you'll notice verse 3 renders the text like this, and there lay a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. It's not much better, but it does capture in accurate detail the scene which we find the Lord Jesus Christ in here this morning at the pool of Bethesda. Here we have a great multitude of invalid folk, supposedly. Men, blind, lame, unable to move, unable to see, unable to do anything meaningful by society's standards. And yet, just as we saw last week with the nobleman's son and Jesus working in the life of him, once again we see a second kind of miraculous healing. A back-to-back miracle in John's Gospel, chapter 4, and now straight into chapter 5. Only this time, John is drawing a direct contrast between how the nobleman family responded and how this paralyzed man responds here in John chapter 5. Only this time, the story isn't ending how we thought it would end. It kind of destroys our predispositions toward how we think people will respond to God's gifts. But as we're going to see that the story this morning in John 5 ends in a very sobering fashion. This morning's sermon is designed to wake us up from our lethargy and spiritual blindness concerning the goodness, the grace, and the glory of God that should lead us to repentance, should lead us to holiness. It's a story about a man made whole healed for the sake of holiness on the Sabbath day in order to demonstrate that Jesus is, in fact, Lord of the Sabbath. He is equal to God, his Father. But this man doesn't respond in how he should. And we will see that as we make our way through. So this morning's sermon, main point I want us to see, Jesus comes as Lord of the Sabbath for the weary, withered and waiting. Jesus comes as Lord of the Sabbath for the weary, withered, and waiting. Two-part outline, the healing of the man and the hostility of the Jew. So let's begin John chapter 5, verse 1. John writes this, that after this healing of the nobleman's son and before the healing of this lame paralytic in chapter 5, a Jewish festival took place. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. 
Now, we're not sure exactly how long has passed since the end of chapter 4 and this beginning here in verse 1 of chapter 5. Some suggest that in between these two uh, sections, several months have indeed passed. Others, maybe several weeks. I don't think it really matters. Uh, We know that in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, they record for us many other events that take place when Jesus comes to, to Galilee, the region of Galilee. So at this point in his ministry, as he's heading back to Jerusalem in verse 1, I think uh, Jesus has called the 12 disciples at this point that we see in the other Gospels, him calling them. I think uh, he's healed a man of demonic oppression in the temple. He's forgiven the paralytic sins that's lowered through the roof in Mark 2. Uh, He's healed an unclean leper. He's attended a banquet. His fame has begun to spread throughout uh, Cana Cana of Galilee and throughout really the whole Galilean region. He goes down to Capernaum and some of the synoptics and spends some time there. And so John, with verse 1, after this, that's John's way of saying that a considerable amount of time has passed since the ending of chapter 4. And so Jesus is now back heading to Jerusalem for another Jewish festival. And while he's there, Jesus decides to pass by a gate. It's the sheep gate on the northern side of the city. Now, the gate itself is constructed around a pool within it. It has five large uh, colonnades or portico structures that would protect those who were withered and waiting under these structures from the, the harsh elements of the, of the uh, Middle Eastern sun that would come, the, the, the elements of the weather uh, the, these large portico, five structures would protect. And, um, and within these five structures, there was two pools. And the name of these pools, or the name of this place, was Bethesda. Beth, meaning house, and hesed, meaning mercy. The word Bethesda literally means the house of mercy. The house of love. Quite a fitting description for what we find in verse 3, that within this home lay a great multitude of men, blind, lame, waiting for that stirring of the water. Studies show that Bethesda was a spring-fed pool. So there was probably a lot of natural earth movements with the stirring of the water that would naturally occur by God's design of, um, you know, the moving of the earth and, and things like that, the, the, the pool would begin to stir up. But we're also told that these waters had rich minerals in them, which probably had some medicinal value to it. But see, for whatever reason, there was a, a, a local Jewish myth that had been adopted that every now and then, the reason why the water would stir is because an, an angel would come down into the water, it would stir the water up, and it would give this water special healing properties as a result of the water's stirring. And it would give healing properties to the first person into the water. That was sort of this superstitious myth that these people had adopted. And this is what the man references in verse 7. I have no one to put me into the pool when the water's stirred up. While I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. It's quite a dog-eat-dog kind of place. First come, first serve. Quite ironic for the house of mercy. Now, you may have wondered to yourself, where exactly did verse 4 go in my Bible? If you're reading from a modern translation, 1, 2, 3, 5, who numbered this thing? Verse 4 here is actually missing from our modern translations, unless you're reading from the King James or the New King James, verse 4 probably won't be in your Bible. Uh, And this is, I think, for good reason. Uh, Most of the older, more reliable Greek manuscripts don't actually have the explanation of this angel coming down into the water here in verse 4. Most manuscripts have what we call a textual variant, which means that verse 4 was, uh, I think, never intended to be part of Holy Scripture. Uh, And what I think has most likely happened is that a scribe copying John's gospel many centuries ago, he was copying it and he came to, uh, you know, the stirring of the water that this man held to, this paralytic man. And he wanted to explain why the water was being stirred up. And so I think that he's probably written in the margin of his papyri or his Bible when he's copying John's John's manuscript uh, because he's adopted this myth, this local Jewish myth, But then somehow, for whatever reason, another copyist or another scribe has come along after him and and seen that 
that, that, that side um, comment, and it's somehow been absorbed into the main body of John's gospel. It's been absorbed into the manuscript, and it's been taken as holy scripture. Uh, most scholars, however, agree it should not be part of John's gospel. It's a scribal error that someone has made years ago. Now, let me say that this should in no way diminish our confidence of the Bible, diminish our trustworthiness uh, or the the trustworthiness of uh, God's word given to us. In fact, if anything, I think this should increase our confidence in God's Bible because uh, we can go back over the 5,000 plus Greek manuscripts. We can see where uh, someone's tried to add or take away from God's word. And we can have absolute certainty that uh, the, the Bible we have in our hands today is the very word of God. It's how God intended his church to have it. And so I've, I've, well, I think I've often said to people in the past, maybe I haven't, but uh, this, this should bring us great confidence in knowing that if God has got, gone to such great lengths to preserve his word, if he's gone to such great lengths to give his revelation through centuries of, of speaking to his people through prophets and priests and kings and apostles and ultimately through Jesus Christ, his one and only son, then he will go to even greater lengths to preserve his holy revelation given to his church. If, if God is zealous for his church to worship him in spirit and in truth, through the truth of his word, then he will not allow his bride to go astray when it comes to scripture. I think the missing verse four in our modern translations is a wonderful reminder. It's a wonderful reality that God loves his word. And if you're still not sure what I'm even talking about, don't worry, lecture over, come see me after the service, we can have a chat. Verse five, now a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. 38 years this man had been sitting at the pool. So this would be no silent miracle. Uh, This would be no quiet and quick brush kind of healing, unlike the other signs and and miracles we've seen in the, the cover of obscurity. Jesus picks a very crowded public place and he picks a man who was well known in the community with a lot of invalids sitting around him to do his next miraculous sign. He would make this pool into a theater for his glory. He knew exactly what he was doing by being in this place on this day with this particular man. And if I'm honest, I don't quite fully understand the pastoral strategy behind Jesus' question in verse 6. Perhaps you're wondering to yourself, what is Jesus exactly doing I don't quite get the the, the game plan here, Jesus. Do you want to be made well? (laughs) He's at a pool where there's this myth where he will be made well. I think he wants to get well. I mean, this is one of those verses that, as we've seen, I think we've come to expect the unexpected when it comes to Jesus. That, That what seems cruel, incredibly cruel on the surface, is actually something more going on because Jesus is always talking on a different level. This is, this is just what John showed us time and time again. He did it with the Pharisees in John 2. He did it with the woman in John 4. He did it with the disciples in Samaria. And he's doing it with this man in John 5. He always gets to the very issue of our hearts, the deepest need. He draws us out by way of questions. I love how the King James renders uh, this verse in verse 6, this question, will thou be made whole? Friends, I wonder what you would have said to Jesus if you were this man. Now be careful in answering that question too quickly. Be careful in what you think you would have said to Jesus because at first glance, it it actually seems quite easy. Yes, a thousand times, yes, please heal me. I've been this way for 38 years. But as one pastor has suggested, if all you've ever known was a particular way of life, If all you've ever known is bondage and and slavery to a particular thing, the idea of freedom is actually quite scary. It's quite terrifying to think. If all you've ever known is limit and restriction, the idea 
of freedom is a radical threat to your existence. I mean, think about this guy, this paralytic who's been paralyzed for 38 years of his life. He doesn't have an income. He doesn't have a, a trade. He doesn't seemingly have anyone. He doesn't have a family. He's learned to become very dependent. He's learned to make a living by being a paralyzed man. And for the first time in his life, Jesus is threatening all he's ever known as a paralyzed man who's dependent. And it actually seems like from the response in verse 7, did you notice, he's become very comfortable in his condition, almost as if he doesn't want to be made well. Sir, I have no one to help me into the water, and when I go down, someone jumps ahead of, ahead of me. He, he doesn't so much answer the question as he does complaining to Jesus. This man immediately responds by looking to others, to looking to something else as the cause of his problem. He immediately responds by pinning the blame on other people. This sad state of feeling sorry for himself. Now, we've all met people like this man, the very kind of people who, uh, the moment they would get out of prison, will go right back in the very next day because they have learned to depend on the inside world. They can't survive on the outside. All they've ever known is a free bed, free rent, free accommodation, and free living. And so if Jesus makes this guy well, if he heals his life, he's going to have to learn to contribute. He's going to have to learn to live in such a way that he's no longer dependent on other people. We've all heard the joke where Jesus goes into a bar and he's touching people and they're all instantly healed. The blind man sees and and one guy says, don't touch me, get away. I'm on workers' comp. <laughs> you had to think about it. That's kind of like what this guy is. I don't think he wants to get better. He's very comfortable in his condition. And Jesus' question is a radical threat to his very existence. But friends, isn't this the same for us in the gospel, what Jesus does to us? in our spiritual paralysis of sin and living a certain way where we are the king and Christ is not? Isn't this what the gospel says, that are you sure you really want to be made well to give up that sin, to take up your cross and to follow the Savior? Are you really ready to leave behind your spiritual pattern of Addiction and be transformed by the Spirit of God. Do you really, really want what Jesus can give here this morning? This question gets to the very heart, very center of all that we are as Christians, and it threatens our very existence of all we've ever known as being born in sin. Now, Jesus doesn't wait for the man to respond in faith, unlike the nobleman last week, but rather Jesus simply says to him, he commands, and notice the man obeys. He doesn't wait for the man to respond in faith. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk, and instantly the man got well. Instantly he picked up his mat. Instantly he started to walk. No magic formula, no incantation, no uh, wizardry of elves and, and, and hocus-pocus kind of nonsense. He simply speaks... And it occurs. He speaks, Genesis 1, and creation obeys. This is Jesus making the man whole through the sovereign power as the creator and sustainer of the world. And notice, when Jesus speaks, this is not an ambiguous healing. Uh, this is not a, a, an ambiguous miracle. It's not like he had a bad back a sore foot, uh, one, one foot shorter than the other, or nothing like we see today healings to be. This is, this is tangible, verifiable, like able to be proven, 38 years kind of stuff. A sign, um, a miracle that only God in the flesh could really ever do. And this, I think, sets for us the biblical criteria for all true and miraculous healings we see throughout the Bible. Friends, if you're ever wondering how to verify whether or not a miraculous healer in town is actually legitimate, 
Well, I think we have some biblical criteria here in John 5 to, to test. There's four basic elements of a biblical healing that I see here in John 5, and it's throughout the Bible as well. All genuine miracles or healings must be immediate, verifiable, comprehensive, and authenticated. Let me run through these really quick and then we'll move on to point two. Firstly, uh, all genuine healings are immediate. They are immediately noticeable and done. Verse nine, instantly the man got well. He picked up his mat and started to walk. Instantly, instantly, not progressively. No wobbly legs, no, uh, I think it's feeling a bit better, no, no rehab, no physio, nothing that needed more faith, okay? Nothing that needed more prayer or anything like that. The man was instantly, in a moment, he got up and he walked. Secondly, they are verifiable. Uh, go back to verse 5. This man was known in the community 38 years. He was at this, he'd, he'd been coming to this pool. He was known by the Jewish community. He was known by the other multitude of men. He was not just some random guy who showed up to a Benny Hinn healing complaining of, you know, an internal thing that no one could really verify. Some guy seated in a wheelchair that we just have to believe he was once crippled. No, this man was known. He, he, was, he was able to be uh, it was able to be proved whether or not he really legitimately was healed by the fact that he got up and started to walk. Thirdly, uh, genuine healings, I think, are comprehensive. Uh, they're never partial healings like a lot of the healings we have today. It's not like, well, you know, the man got healed, but he was really just limping and he needed a, a, a cane afterwards. Uh, the, the, you know, God healed me of my cancer, but it came back, you know, the very next week or something like that. So there was a genuine healing, but I think, I think God heals a person. It's always 100% restoration uh, if it's claimed by as a divine healing. Now, that's not to say God uh, always fully restores and heals us in our infirmities when he heals us uh, through his grace. But this, we're talking about people who claim to have the gift of healing, the miraculous gift of healing, faith healers today, uh, who are really, I think, just charlatan snakes looking to gain money. None of this half-hearted, partial kind of nonsense we see. And then lastly, uh, genuine healings are authenticating. All genuine miracles have a biblical message they're proving to, to prove, they're, they're seeking to prove, rather. This is the whole reason God gives miraculous signs in Scripture. This is why the, the miracles are in the Bible. Not so we would look to that, but look to beyond the miracles to the message that the prophet, whoever it was that was doing the miracle, was proclaiming. Are you a true prophet of God? Demonstrate the power through the signs. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus heals the paralytic man lowered through the roof. And he says to the man, see, your faith has made you well. Your sins are forgiven. Some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God? God alone is the only one who can forgive sins. And by the way, they were 100% right. Only God forgives sins. And Jesus forgave his sins. Jesus is God. Verse 8, and immediately Jesus, now notice, perceiving in his spirit that they question within themselves, so he knows the heart of man, another attribute that is distinct to God, knowing the hearts of mankind, Psalm 139. They said, why do you question, uh, sorry, he said, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or rise, pick up your bed and walk? Well, clearly, your sins are forgiven. It's easier because you don't have to prove anything outwardly. You just claim it, and how do we know? It's easier to say sins are forgiven rather than make this lame man walk. He says, but so you may know that I have authority on earth to forgive sins, I say to this man, get up, take up your bed and walk, and instantly... The message of forgiveness of sins was proved through the healing. Jesus forgave his sins and the healing of the man proves the message. All genuine miracles have a biblical message they are seeking to authenticate through the sign. And so the question is, as we come to John chapter 5, the healing of this lame man at this pool of Bethesda, what is the message Jesus was seeking to give? 
What was the message he was trying to prove through healing the man on the Sabbath? Well, to see that, we must turn to point number two, from the healing of the man to the hostility of the Jews. And this is where uh, things really start to ramp up between Jesus and the religious authorities. The Jews here is just a a euphemism for the religious Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Levites, etc., etc. And John shows us that we're about to come into some real drama from here on in, in John's gospel, because of verse 9, end of verse 9, look at these foreboding words, now that day was the Sabbath. And you're supposed to hear that with, you know, this eerie kind of dun, dun, dun kind of music. It's John's way of setting up that something dramatic is going to come. And sure enough, sooner than we can read that verse, we read of the drama in verse 10. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, this is the Sabbath. The law prohibits you from picking up your mat. How blind are they to the glory of God? A man has just been healed. And what do they say to him? Get back down there and be lame. Check your calendar next time. This is the Sabbath. It's, it's amazing. But the man tries to shift the blame. The one who made me well, he told me to pick up my mat and walk. Wasn't me. Well, who's the man who told you to pick up your mat? And surprisingly, the man doesn't even get Jesus' name. He slips away into the crowd because, I mean, the crowd noticed there's Fred, right? The guy who hadn't been walking for 38 years. Fred, Fred's walking, guys. Guys, and the whole place is, I think, in an uproar, crowding around Fred because he's now walking. He's picked up his mat as God had commanded and the only thing these, these Pharisees, these Jewish religious leaders can think to do, they were more interested in the law being broken than in the glory of God through this man being healed. How wicked, how evil is the human heart to prefer their own religious zeal over the sovereign and glorious grace of God? And yet, not only do these Pharisees completely miss the point, even this man is beginning to miss the point. He, as I said, shifts the blame in verse 11. He doesn't go to Jesus and and thank him or anything like that. The man replies, the one who made me well. Where have we heard words like that in the Bible? Where have we heard words like that in the book of Genesis with Adam and Eve standing before God? Guilty. As Adam says to the man, it's the woman you gave me. She told me to eat. She gave me the fruit. It was her passing the buck, as man always does. He pins the blame on the very one who gives him life in the garden. And what do we see here in John chapter 5? But a man pinning the blame on the very one who'd just given him a new life through this new set of legs. Nothing has changed Dear friends, since Genesis chapter 3, nothing has changed in humanity's demeanor toward God and his good gifts. He gives gifts each and every day, and yet we in our sin spurn the grace and exchange it for a lie. This man throws Jesus under the bus. He doesn't want to deal with these Pharisees who condemn him for taking up his mat, which, by the way, was in no way a violation of the Sabbath commandment. This is nowhere forbidden in Holy Scripture that a man was not allowed to be healed and take up his mat and walk, especially given the fact that it was God himself who told the man to do this. Now, perhaps they were thinking of Exodus 31 with the breaking of the fourth commandment, the Sabbath law, you know, do no rest on the Sabbath day. But even if you look in the the prophets, like um, uh, places like Jeremiah 17 that say, be careful not to carry a load on the Sabbath or bring it through the city gates. And if this man gets healed and Jesus tells him to walk, he's definitely walking through that sheep gate that Jesus came in to get through into the main body of the city. It's just the, the normal way he would have gone. But friends, those kinds of injunctions and commands aren't talking about this They speak of regular, everyday employment to rest so that your trust wasn't in your employment or money. Your trust is in God. So unless this guy was a furniture removalist who carried beds for a living, which was not his regular 
employment. He was, FYI, 38 years he, he, he wasn't moving. He ain't breaking any laws. He's not violating God's Sabbath laws like these Jews say. See, throughout the centuries, the, the Jewish religious leaders, they, they started to create dozens and dozens of extra biblical laws when it came to even coming close to God's laws. And what started out as a a good and right motive quickly turned into a false sinful piety. And they, in their zeal to try and guard the, the good laws of God, became more invested in the outward appearance of holiness rather than the inward reality of a pure and clean heart. A heart that seeks first the kingdom of God and the king behind the commandments, the God behind the law. And so these Jews had done what all religious people tend to do. They take good and gracious things like the law of God and somehow they manage to turn it into a a man-made religious thing and started to go above and beyond what God actually had originally said. One pastor has put it uh, very well. The Pharisees served as moats guarding around God's holy law. Think of a moat around a castle to prohibit any person from even getting close to breaking God's law. So they added these extra biblical laws to to stop anyone from even coming close. So these Pharisees had become so invested in the outward appearance of godliness, they completely miss a man who's 38 years paralyzed is now walking. That is something to rejoice in. It's wicked what they do. It's wicked, and it's in the heart of each and every one of us. We who have looked at the goodness and grace poured out in other people's lives, and yet the only thing we can do is try to find something wrong to judge them with. And we look down upon other people and the good gifts God's given, and we completely miss his grace in light of our own religious zeal. And so unless God opens our eyes to the glory of his goodness, we will spend our lives missing his grace and replacing it with, with, our own, with our own glory, our own standards. But see, Jesus will not have our religious zeal trump, our false religious zeal trump his sovereign grace. He won't allow you and I to spurn the gifts and the goodness that he's poured out without first giving us a severe warning for doing so. And that's what we see here in verse 14. After this, Jesus found the man in the temple, the one he'd made well. And he said to the man, see, you are well. Do not sin anymore so that something worse doesn't happen to you. Sin no more so that something worse doesn't happen. Now, a lot of ink has been spilled over these verses, caused a lot of grief, a lot of head scratching in uh, people's minds. I don't think it's, it's as difficult as people make him out to be. There's some interpretation on what Jesus is talking about. I simply think Jesus is saying to the man, grace leads to godliness. God's grace should lead us to greater and greater godliness. That once we experience Christ's redemptive work, we now live in light of that grace. And that living in light of should cause us to holiness. Not to sinless perfectionism. We can't ultimately rid ourselves of sin in this life, but to greater and greater degrees of holiness and Christ-likeness. That's the whole point of the gospel. That once God saves us, we become more and more like the one we're called two as sons and daughters. I think at the end of the day, Jesus says this, that I've just given you a gift, a free gift that you didn't even ask for. And if you continue to walk in your sin after seeing the grace and the goodness of God through that gift, then the judgment you receive at the end of time will be far worse than 38 years disabled. That if we continue to walk in rebellion after receiving a knowledge of the goodness and grace of God in the gospel, then we will face a far worse judgment in hell than mere physical sickness. 
As Paul says in Romans 2, the kindness of God should lead us to repentance. The goodness of God should lead us to holiness. The issue is not the man's healing. The issue is his sin. And apparently, for whatever reason, I think Jesus is linking his personal sickness, his 38 years, to his own personal sinfulness, something that has occurred in his life that God has judged him with. Now, we have to be careful when when we make statements like this that we don't always draw a direct parallel, direct straight line between someone's personal sin and their suffering or sickness. Not all sickness is a direct result of our own personal sin, but there are times when God does wake us up from our sinfulness through sickness. Not all sickness is a direct result of our own personal sin. Sometimes, however, there are instances when it is. And I think, now I could be wrong, absolutely I could be wrong, that Jesus is, is drawing this man to his 38 years of paralytic status to say sin no more, lest a far worse thing than 38 years come upon you if you spurn the gift I've given. Sometimes God takes a shot across the bow into our lives when we are not walking in the way that he tells us to walk. Uh, we see multiple instances of this in and throughout uh, the Bible. Uh, one such place, Genesis chapter 6, uh, God floods the entire world. Man's constant rebellion and evil results in God's judgment upon the entire world. Uh, Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, they try to lie to the Holy Spirit and God immediately kills them. Uh, We saw in 1 Corinthians 11 when Craig was preaching through Corinthians that there are Christians who are taking the Lord's Supper. There's divisiveness, there's factions in the church. Some of them are not waiting and, and, um, and showing love for others in the church when it comes to the Lord's Supper. Some of them are fighting and quarreling and still going to the Lord's table in an unworthy way. Some of them were even getting drunk off the elements. And so God, in his holiness, swiftly and severely makes some of them sick and others he kills. He says, Paul says, some have fallen asleep. It's it's a nice way to say they're dead. And now here in John 5, this man was being warned through 38 years of sickness to repent, trust in God, give glory to Jesus, lest he experience something far worse than mere physical danger. Not all sickness is a direct result of our personal sin, though sometimes, and it's hard to tell, sometimes we can't tell, God will take a shot across the bow to wake us up. Now, the incredible thing, friends, the, the, the heartbreaking reality is that in this account, right after we read of Jesus' severe warning to this man, we immediately re- read in the very next verse, in verse 15, the man goes and reports to the Jews and throws him under the bus. The man went and told the Jews that it was Jesus who was the one who made him well. Suddenly he's learned his name and he wants to go and report Jesus to the Pharisees. And in light of that, because of that, therefore the Jews began persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. And just a few verses later, they openly tried to kill Jesus. Friends, this is not just blame. This is betrayal on the pages of Scripture. This is a man spurning the goodness and the gift that God had just given to him, and he refuses to walk in holiness. What what a contrast to the woman of Samaria. What, What a contrast to the nobleman's house who come to saving faith. This man does not heed the severe warning and the judgment of of God to come, but he throws him under the bus. Friends, this is a severe and sobering warning for each and every one who names the name of Christ, that we, calling ourselves Christians, 
live in light of the gospel as Christians. Let me finish here today with a, a story I heard that I think helps illustrate this point. It's about a man who fought many years ago for Alexander the Great. When his troops were engaged in a very serious battle, one of the soldiers who were fighting in the war fled the scene. He ran away and he was labeled a coward. After the battle, the coward was apprehended and he was brought to the tent of Alexander the Great. He stood there trembling before the very presence of his commander and king. And Alexander the Great looked at this young boy and he said, son, why did you try to flee? The boy said, I was afraid. He said, I see. What's your name? Asked Alexander. What is your name? The boy mumbled his answer and Alexander the Great said, son, speak up. I asked you, what is your name? And the young soldier looked at the king and said, my name is Alexander. And Alexander the Great looked at the boy directly in the eyes and he said, son, either change your behavior or change your name. Either change your behavior or change your name. Friends, if you're here this morning and you're not yet a Christian, you're not yet trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, we're so glad you're here. Please, please don't hear me with what I'm about to say in a wrong way, but, but there is a severe warning for each and every person who reads this account of this man and yet continues to walk in the pattern of this man, spurning the goodness and the mercy and the grace that has been poured out for him in his life. There are worse things in this world than 38 years disabled. And one of those is falling under the right, just judgment of a holy God because of sin. Friends, our only hope here in this story is the very Jesus who heals sinners for the sake of holiness. Jesus is the one who gives forgiveness of sins and a new life through his substitutionary death and resurrection on the cross. He dies as a sacrifice bearing the punishment that all of us should have received because of our sin that we commit against him. And the good news here is that not that we earn or maintain our salvation, we, we can't do that. But the good news is that even when we in our paralyzed state cannot reach out to, to Christ, he, in his word, reaches down to us. And Jesus comes to us in our sin as both Savior and the judge, as both Redeemer and yet warner, warning us of our sin so that we repent, we turn and we trust and we walk in a manner that is pleasing to him. Not, not earning salvation, not maintaining it, but living in light of the grace we've received, the gift that has been given in Christ. This story in John 5, brothers and sisters, it serves, it serves to demonstrate what one preacher has said as the good news of the gospel for spiritually exhausted people. After 38 years of futility and waiting, this man at the pool is the very picture, he's the, the epitome of spiritual exhaustion. Surrounded by men, surrounded by people, surrounded by crowds, and yet completely unable to get well. This inability in the human soul to do anything to the glory of God. This is us in our paralyzed state of deadness in sin. And Jesus comes as Lord of the Sabbath. He comes as Lord of rest to give spiritually exhausted people the rest they crave in him. Rest from sin, rest from ultimate judgment and suffering, rest from the toil of having to try and earn our salvation to simply rest in Jesus and allowing his goodness, his works, his life 
credited to our account, rest for the weary, withered, and the waiting. The God who offers us rest in this story is the God who cares enough to warn us that to turn away from him, to to turn away from his goodness is ultimately to face a far greater judgment. And if he did not love you, he would not warn you. And unlike this man in John 5, friends, there is still hope for each and every person who has life in in their lungs, the breath in their lungs here this morning. There is still hope for you and I to turn, to trust, to come to the water of life, Jesus Christ, and experience the true Sabbath rest that he gives as both Savior and Judge and Deliverer of the world. And if you're a Christian here this morning, friends, claiming to know Jesus but living in open, rebellious, apathetic sin, living in a way that you know you shouldn't be but you really don't care, if you're not fighting your sin like the gospel tells us we should do, then either change your behavior or change your name. In the words of Scripture, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Come to Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Find life in Jesus, friends. For where else can we go in life but to the one who gives us rest? Let's pray. Well, Lord, another week and another convicting passage for all of us, Lord, myself included. Father, we thank you that expository preaching, preaching through the Bible, not skipping verses, forces us to deal with the really tricky passages, Lord. We thank you for that, but we also ask and pray that you would not just let us become comfortable and calloused in our our pattern of life, our sinful ways, but you constantly are redeeming and reforming and convicting and, and, and sanctifying us through your word. Father, we thank you for these last several weeks that you've shown us about the, the amazing grace that's given to Christ every single week. It is the same message that John says, so that we may believe. Oh, Father, I ask, I desperately pray that you would not allow these men and women here today, to go unchanged from this place. That they would not go on in their open rebellious sin, but they would put to death the deeds of the body through the Spirit that has come by Jesus dying on the cross. Father, wake all of us up. Now, the next time we try to so openly walk in rebellion, wake us up, remind us of this man, Remind us of Jesus' words in verse 14. And may that ultimately drive us, as it's designed to do, to the good and gracious Savior who loves us enough to warn us. May that ultimately result in us glorying in our Redeemer. We ask and we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.